I've been attempting to expand my TCG palette for a while now, starting with games like Vario, Wager of Troops, and Silverwing Legacy. It's been great experiencing something that plays vastly different than your current top three, Magic, Yu-Gi-Oh! and Pokemon. For example, Vario is about using your movement and actions to plan your method of attack on a timeline to put an opponent's health to zero, while trying to stop them from killing you. Wager of Troops is about using your cast members, props, and cues to put on a better show than the other player and gain the favor of 10 audience members first. Silverwing Legacy is about using your main character and allies to run out the stamina of the other player before yours does. It's been a nice change of pace from playing a land, flipping a floodgate, or evolving your Pokemon. Each of these games have a new and distinct combinations of different systems to really make these games feel unique in the landscape. And as I've been looking more into the indie TCG scene, I've noticed a lot more of these card games are trying to just become X game with Y system. It's Yu-Gi-Oh with Magic's land system. It's Magic with Hearthstone's combat system. Or it's Pokemon with Yu-Gi-Oh's back row. And it's gotten to such an extreme that I'd like to talk about some of these games and the ramifications of trying to lift systems and drop them into a rule set or design without understanding what they're taking and what it means. I'd like to start off with Pokemon's evolution system, but people tend to like a lot of what Pokemon does. Off the top of my head, I can think of four games that try to use one or more of Pokemon systems as their baseline. Poliwog, Nostalgix, Digimon, and Akora for better or worse. Pokemon is all about using your team of Pokemon to knock out all the other person's team of Pokemon. You do this by stacking up enough energy, evolving your Pokemon, and using trainer cards until they either have no Pokemon left or you've taken up all your prize cards. Each Pokemon card has a couple of key pieces of info on each one. You have their HP, the damage output, how much energy you need to use to an attack, a weakness and resistance to a specific type of Pokemon, the type of Pokemon, what Pokemon, if any, it evolves from, and how much each Pokemon weighs. The idea is to create a strong team of Pokemon in real time to gain prize cards and be the better trainer. Evolution. This is the largest system that most games take inspiration from, and it's most, at least additionally, unique mainstay. So the way it works is you have a basic Pokemon. This is your most starter level Pokemon card. It generally has the lowest health, the weakest attacks, more randomized effects, and really can't win the game on its own. Normally. You can use these po basic Pokemon to evolve into their stronger versions. Charmander into Charmeleon, Trubbish into Garbodor, Pikachu into Raichu. Then you have the next step. These are called Stage 1 Pokemon. You have a little indicator on the top left of the card which specific Pokemon you need to have in play before you can play this specific Stage 1. Next you have Stage 2. Most of this name is the stage before it, but generally bigger numbers all around. You cannot normally evolve the turn you play the previous basic or Stage 1 Pokemon, but there are some ways around it. For the most part, you're stuck with the little basic boy for at least a turn. So evolving is supposed to be a beneficial system, helps you move towards winning, makes your Pokemon stronger, develops the board, and helps you feel like you're playing Pokemon and growing your team along the way. In simple terms, it's basically a system which you take a weaker card, and with a very specific requirement, make it a stronger card over a series of turns. Pokemon is arguably one of the most popular games out there. Of course, a lot of other games want to copy, or at least become inspired by this system, right? Nostalgia is a hell of a drug, and plenty of people have at least heard of the game in their childhood. And specifically, they tend to want to copy Evolution, considering how unique it is to Pokemon. And if so many games are copying the Evo system, it can't be bad, right? Well, in a vacuum, Evolution is bad. Like, really bad. Let me explain. Pokemon was originally created back in the 90s. This was a wild west of card games, and Creatures Inc. was tasked with the challenge of creating a card game out of a digital game of the same name, which really was going to be a difficult undertaking considering we didn't have a bunch of the standards of design principles that we do today. So the best system they could come up with was physically placing the stage of evolution on top of the previous card. And what they came up with is mostly what remains in the Pokemon card game today. There's been a couple changes with having different types of trainers, items, and cards like that in the overall game, but otherwise we're still living in that 90s era with the evolution system. Now, being an old system doesn't necessarily mean that it's a bad system. So what does make it bad? Typically in current card game design, if you make a series of cards that require elements either in play or in your hand to work, the more specific you get, the less consistent pulling off that combo becomes, right? For example, let's take a normal deck of playing cards. It'd be pretty easy to match two of the same color. The deck is only made up of two colors. So realistically, if you were to draw five random cards from the deck at a time, you could likely do it just fine. And if you wanted to scale this, we could do it a multitude of different ways. For example, we could make it so you have to match up the suite. That's also not too bad, and heck, we're on our way to just creating solitaire at this point. But if we wanted to go to an extreme, we could require the specific suite, color, and next number in the sequence, which in solitaire is fine. The system is designed in order to facilitate that kind of matching up. But if we limit ourselves to five cards from the 52 card deck at a time with those restrictions, 
you can kind of see where this difficulty scaling starts to take shape. And as you scale the number of cards in your deck with the complexity of making that combo work is where you start hitting that bad to unplayable area. Most games don't seem to understand the scaling factor. So when a game tries to create in the evolution space, you either typically get something between unplayable or decently consistent with a wide range of options in between. This scale represents what I believe is the difficulty of playing in the game's evolution system. And the level of innovation on the system makes it easier to play. So Poliwag is the hardest, whereas Zakori is the easiest. And I'll explain that scale in a moment. Going back to Pokemon specifically, when we want to evolve our Charmander into a Charizard, we need three specific cards from our deck and three individual turns to evolve them. This is basically as strict as the sweet color sequential number example from earlier, and we can actually demonstrate this difficulty using math. Some players may be aware of a hypergeometric calculator. This is used as a tool to determine the odds of seeing one or more specific cards in your deck. This tool I have here is similar, but allows you to calculate multiple cards you're searching for at once. So we'll plug in our cards, what we're looking for, the count, our deck size, and let's take a look at the odds of getting those three cards in our hand at the start of the game. Oh, well that's not very great, is it? And it doesn't become a guarantee until you've seen almost your entire deck, but it's likely going to happen sooner rather than later with 10 to 20 cards drawn. So it's hard to get all the cards in a row to be able to always evolve smoothly when just trying to draw one card per turn. Well, there's also more of a downside to this system. In Pokemon, you can only play a basic without evolving it from your hand. So if you draw four Charmanders, you can slap them down and call it good. But if you draw any stage one or stage two Pokemon, you can't play them until the previous stage is in play and it's been in play for at least a turn. So if you draw all four Charmeleons and four Charizards before playing a single Charmander, you can't do anything with them. They just sit in your hand waiting. Meaning you could have a giant hand of cards and not be able to actually play the game. Just waiting to either draw that Charmander, play it, wait a turn, or lose the game. Now obviously you're going to be running more than one single line of Charmander, Charmune, and Charizard, but as you increase the number of lines like this, you don't actually make it any easier to evolve any of the others. You're just hoping to get any of them to play. Play Charizard, you're always locked into having at least that Charmander. Now if this system is so awkward, how has Pokemon survived as a card game? Well the biggest reason is they have a massive IP behind them and most people that have Pokemon cards probably don't really play, but those that do have realized that a significant portion of a Pokemon deck isn't actually made up of Pokemon, it's mostly trainer cards. To keep it brief, generally you run 12 to 18 Pokemon, and the rest are a combination of items, supporters, trainers, and energy, all to facilitate finding the exact Pokemon you need at the right moment. So you greatly reduce sitting with a hand of cards you can't play. But the biggest factor is that most people don't run that many evolution lines, if any. A lot of the time you'll see a single, basic to stage one Pokemon line with some kind of utility effect, and the rest of the deck is made up of rules box Pokemon. These are the same thing as a basic Pokemon, you just slap them down and get going, and they generally rule competitive play during the times they're legal. And when they were first coming out, Pokemon had the foresight to make them distinct from a basic Pokemon, adding some kind of rule or tag with them. EX, GX, Tag Team, V, and this little box down here that says you can take two prize cards when they're knocked out. This means that they can add some exclusionary text for either a normal basic or the new type of basic Pokemon when making new cards. Eventually, the Pokemon company also understood that the evolution mechanic in a vacuum just wasn't working out in a meaningful capacity. It was too slow and inconsistent. Most of the tournament play was ruled by just basic Pokemon who had decent stats and decent attack. What they realized is they needed to increase the consistency of getting these evolution Pokemon by a pretty wide factor. And just to show what I mean, here's all the cards that do some kind of searching or drawing for specific Pokemon. It's pretty much all trainers or supporter cards in some capacity. Basically, most cards in your deck will have the goal of searching out a Pokemon. You can't just rely on people sitting and waiting to play your cards. It's a terrible experience for the player. Now, that all said, the games that are copying this system have to understand all this, right? Right? Well, let's break down the different applications of the system according to my proposed difficulty scale. Starting off with, Poliwag is pretty close to Pokemon in a lot of ways. In fact, if you've played Pokemon, you can fumble your way through a game of Poliwag without more than a quick glance at the rulebook. There's three main differences. You win the game when the other player runs out of deck. You don't lose when you have no polywogs in play. This is a life decking game, which means instead of winning due to the life total, you win due to damage to the other person's deck. And once their deck is out, you win. All cards have a resource cost to play them. This is a pretty large change overall. Instead of stringing along a lot of trainers and basics, you instead are forming smaller turns or ramping up your resources in order to get the baseline normal Pokemon turn. 
there are potentially four active Pokemon instead of one. But you have to build your field up in order to play them using cards called Battle Pads. You start with one in play. In order to play more Poliwogs, you need more Battle Pads to place them on. Poliwog has also similar deck building requirements, but it's not one to one. Each card will tell you how many of it you can run in the 60 card deck, plus the extra Battle Pad. Plus you start with an extra Battle Pad outside of your deck. Looking at the cards themselves, they have a weakness, resistance, evolution system, HP, a card type, plus you have basics and their evolutions. You've got items, but in this game they're called mutations. Instead of having separate abilities from attacks, they're combined into a single text box. You kind of just have to know which is which. There's also a stadium type of card called an arena, and they have trainers like in Pokemon, but instead of separating out supporters and items, they're done with one type without the once per turn clause, which is pretty close to how Pokemon originally did it, which they changed because stringing along a bunch of these dudes over and over for free was a little too good. In Pokemon, the only cost equivalent is that you can only play one supporter in a turn, attach one energy in a turn, and nothing resource-wise. Whereas in Poliwag, you get two resources per turn, called Polyrads, and you can spend them to play any card in your hand, or you can pay one of them to draw a card. There's no hard limit for the number of cards you can actually play. What are they doing with the evolution system? Well, for the most part, it's nearly one-to-one. -one. The main difference is you can do it the turn you play the previous stage, and it keeps all information from the previous stage, damage, status conditions, and mutations. However, the difficulty of Pokemon system is intact, and unlike Pokemon, they don't have a vast multitude of extra trainers and supporters that fetch out most of the Pokemon. Most of your keepers have just generic card game effects, drawing a card, shuffling a discard, etc. They do have some cards that can search for Poliwogs, but because everything has a cost, you actually have to make a pretty tough decision between playing one of these or playing a Poliwog, which means that plus of being able to evolve the same turn is immediately negated because you have to draw the card and there's only a single card that can search for a non-basic Poliwog. And it has an incredibly steep cost. It costs two resources, which is your whole turn, and two additional cards from your hand. This is clearly the Ultra Ball equivalent, but the cost really changes the dynamic of this card. Plus, there's no extra draw card in the main set outside of the mechanic of paying one and drawing a card. And if you do that, you're less likely to be able to play the card you drew as now you're down one of your resources. Something else that hinders this system is that most Stage 3 Poliwogs, the Stage 2 equivalent of Pokemon, require more Polyrads than you can have in a turn to play them. So not only do you need to draw the pieces, you then need to draw specific extra pieces, Polyrad Ramp, in order to afford the later evolution lines. And all of that together creates what I believe is the more difficult evolution system when compared to Pokemon, and will cause plenty of games where one player will not be able to hit that stage 3 with so many pieces required, and damage from your opponent can potentially remove them from the game. Remember, it's a life decking game. Making it worse is the deck building system, where most stage 3s can't be ran in the same maximum numbers as lower stages. So that formula we had above gets even worse for some evil lines. Taking this line and adding it into our tool, we get this. And it's clearly much worse than before. So really, with adding the resource system and leaving out the wide range of tutors, you have a game that leans into the worst aspects of the evolution system. A content creator friend of mine, Card Game Crypt, recently released a deep dive into Poliwog, and I'd highly recommend it, as it shows the best thing to do in Poliwog has nothing to do with actually evolving, and hopefully you can see why in his deep dive. Next up is Nostalgix. This is right behind Poliwog on my scale. However, at the very least, it's more mechanically different than Poliwog and Pokemon. The best way to think of Nostalgix is what if you blended Pokemon, Hearthstone, and Yu-Gi-Oh. You have the resource system from Hearthstone, a back row equipment-like system from Yu-Gi-Oh, and obviously, the evolution system from Pokemon. The three biggest similarities are combat, you don't have energy, but it's the same templating along with weakness and resistance. You can also attack other players directly as opposed to their Pokemon to lower their health total. In this game, Pokemon are called fighters. Unlike Pokemon, all your fighters in play can attack, but not on the first turn you play them, which is a fairly large change, but still follows the same templating. Evolution, same as Pokemon. However, you don't have to wait a full turn to evolve, but you can't attack the same turn that you played the previous stage. Prize cards. So Nostalgix has the prize card system, but it functions slightly differently. Instead of being cards from your deck, they're just a nebulous token that exists in a pile, and you remove them as you knock out the other player's fighters. But you don't need to always knock them out with an attack. Even using a card to remove the fighter can cause you to pick up a prize token. And once you remove the last one, you win. You can also win by lowering the other player's health total to zero. Nostalgix also has a similar deck building system. It's 50 cards for us, but you also have a hero card to pick for outside of your deck. 
The cards themselves have weakness, resistance, evolution, HP, and a card type. Plus you have basics and their evolutions, you have items, but in this game they're called equipment, and they also have abilities. There's also trainers like in Pokemon, but instead of separating them out in supporters and items, they're all one card type. In this game they call them spells as opposed to trainers. And there's also a type of card called surprises. These are like traps from Yu-Gi-Oh! and have a cost to put them down, but then not to play them. Plus the traditional stadium called arenas, and most cards have a cost to play them. This is where the Hearthstone mana system comes in. You get one max mana in a turn, and it refills all of your mana for that turn at the start. So, how does it use the evolution system with what we know about the game? Well, like Polylog, it's pretty much one-to-one. -one. Granted, you do get to evolve the turn and play the card, which is a pretty big deal. However, you're also limited by the cost of the fighter, so you can't just do it all in three turns like Polywalk or Pokemon, which means your fighter may get killed before you can evolve. The reason being is each fighter has a mana cost, and each turn you're limited to one mana for the first turn, two mana for the second turn, so on and so forth. Some of the top end fighters have a pretty big mana cost, which means you're hard limited to not be able to evolve some of the fighters until a specific turn. Some of them are pretty late in the game, so a decent minus to be able to evolve in the same turn. How about the searching? Well, also pros and cons. Unlike Poliwag, we don't have free card draw each turn unless you're playing a specific hero, the Lucky Frog Merchant. There's also only one direct search card in the game so far in an arena called Mob Arena, which can't come down before turn 3 and it also costs a resource to get specific fighters under 3 cost. But there's at least quite a few of just raw draw cards. This is a prize called Yellow Card, which is one of those traps you place down. And there's six different spells you can play. Reload, Metal Card Flick, Alternate Timeline, Just Desserts, Lucky Draw, and Payoff. Most of them being 3 to 4 costs, so they aren't great early on, and of the two early ones, only one of them is all that great. This means that hitting your evolution line is mostly random and doesn't generally happen until late game. There's no Ultra Balls here. Adding all this up again creates a more difficult evolution system than Pokemon, and will cause a good amount of games where one or both players will not be able to hit that stage 3, either due to the stage 2 dying to combat or not finding in the fighter soon enough. Granted, there's no life decking, so they can't go away for no reason like in Poliwog, and thankfully deck building isn't artificially limiting your evo lines. But you're still basically looking at the same formula from before, we're limited to the turn count as opposed to any other outside factor. Adding the resource system and the randomized card draw with having zero tutor effects has left you in a situation where you're better off playing only stage 1-2 to two fighter lines or just big basics like in Pokemon. It's mostly tied with Poliwog, but at least we have more raw card draw. So that's two examples of games that took the system nearly one to one without significant innovation, and in doing so, created the more complex space for the system to work in. A lack of card draw and targeted tutor also created the slower system for you to be able to actually evolve your Pokemon. Now, let's look at some of the games that took the system and gave it a significant mutation to make it fresh in the current TCG design. With them being so different from Pokemon in general, I won't describe the game as a whole, but rather just their system and its general changes from Pokemon. Digimon 2020 is Bandai's current Digimon system, and this game is a pretty fresh take on it. Now for context, you have a second deck in this game, and it contains just the most basic level Digimon like a basic in Pokemon, and once per turn you can either take the top card of the deck and put it into the breeding area, or take the Digimon in the breeding area and move it to the normal field. To win the game you have to remove all your opponent's security, kind of like a reverse prize card system, and you're able to play onto Digimon into either the breeding area or straight into play. This is the first big deviation from the Pokemon system, you can play any Digimon just on its own without having to evolve them first. If you take a look at a card, you can see two costs. One main cost to just play it, and a cost to play it on top of a Digimon that matches the color of the dot. Instead of requiring a specific named card, just match the colors to evolve. And if the level is the next one in the sequence, you're good to go. This means that all of these can evolve into all of these, which really opens up the system. And every time you Digivolve, you get to draw a card. So instead of the mechanics leading it to just straight minus ones, you going down a card in your hand while not technically increasing the number of cards in play, you can cycle each evolution to its next. You can still miss, but it's baked in as part of the system, so it's more difficult to miss as hard as you can in Pokemon. But at its core, it's still the same system. You take your card in play and make it stronger with a specific, albeit less specific as in Pokemon, second card from your hand. The game has more ways to find other cards as part of the Evo chains as well, but they aren't searching in the same way as Pokemon, they usually look at the top X cards of your deck, which is fine, but is a little less consistent. Having the extra card draw for participating in the system, along with the lax requirements, created an easier way to utilize it while keeping the spirit of the mechanic alive. And the last game I wanted to talk about, and the one I put in the easiest side of the scale, just in terms of being able to perform the mechanic, is Akora. 
Now, this is a pretty new game, having their Kickstarter only finished this year, so I don't have a ton of in-depth experience with this one, but their rule set isn't too complex, and what I really care about is how they handle the evolution system in the first place. You have a mana system, like in Magic, instead of lands, they're called Relic Shards, and they're in your deck, and you can only play one during your turn. For the Korea cards themselves, it has the name, an attack, the stage, and the type. To evolve in this game, you do need to match the previous specific name. However, if you have enough relic shards in play, you can skip any stage and get to the highest one you can. The biggest difference, similar to Digimon, is that you have a separate deck for Korra. And in that deck, instead of just the most starter level Korra, it's three copies of each stage. So they remove the ability to ever whiff on drawing any of the previous or future evolution stages. They're all in that deck. This gives you a near furthest mutation from this mechanic while still maintaining the spirit of it, where you just always have access to all the stages and can play them in any order you'd like, but you always start with the first one in play. It removes the need for having to run a bunch of search and card draw in your deck just to filter out and search for your Akora. What this does is allows you to put in the main deck a bunch of cards that maybe would have been stapled to Pokemon before, or in this case, Korra. So you can play a lot of those traditional basic card game style archetypes, you know, burn combo, stuff like that, without having to dilute your deck with a bunch of cards to go and find those Akora pieces. So just to cap everything off, if you want to have a system that requires a specific progression from one hyper specifically templated card to another, don't. Or if you do, take a long hard look at how Pokemon does it and what their competitive players do with that system. The ratios, the numbers, and how often those kinds of cards get run in, why? Or try to iterate on the system like Digimon or Okora did. Don't just drag and drop Pokemon's evolution system directly into your game. The more specific you make this system and the requirement for evolving, the more inconsistent you inherently make your game. The less tutors or card draw you have, again, the more inconsistent you're going to make it. And that's all I really have to say on the system for today, man. Hopefully people looking to use the evolution system in their game take some of these points to mining, incorporate them into their use. Until next time, see ya!